Most estates leaving Mercedes factory look just like this, but these weren't the first Mercedes estates, not by a long shot. The concept of an estate car predates the automobile and finds its origins, like most car body style names, in a type of horse-drawn carriage. The estate car or station wagon was a type of carriage used to go between country estates and the local railway station. The first auto car station wagons appeared in the US in the early 1900s, when independent coach builders began producing custom wooden bodies for Ford Model Ts. As a result, in the US a station wagon was sometimes known as a woody. And even up to the 1980s and 1990s, long after the bodies had ceased to be made of wooden frames, many station wagons sported wooden trim, such as the Ford Country Squire and the Chrysler Town & Country. The estate car, station wagon or combi grew in popularity during the latter half of the 20th century and reigned supreme in the middle class big family car market until the introduction of the people carrier or minivan which themselves have given way to the SUV and the crossover SUVs now being produced by most major manufacturers. The first Mercedes-Benz Estates, or Combi for Combinations Craft Wagon, as they were marketed, appeared in the early 1950s on the W136 chassis. The W136, commonly known as the 170V, had been built from 1936 until 1942. It's a fairly distant ancestor of today's E-Class. In the summer of 1941, production of passenger cars finally came to a standstill at Daimler-Benz under Chairman Wilhelm Kissel and his board, who realised that the war would not end as swiftly as anticipated. Production was switched to focus entirely on military output. Despite heavy bombing of the Sindelfingen factory at Stuttgart, enough of the 170V's tooling survived to become the basis for the rebuilding of the company post-war. Production resumed in 1947 and continued until 1955. Enter the 1950s. West Germany is experiencing its economic miracle, the future looks bright, and the Western world is recovering quickly. Across the Atlantic, US car companies, such as Plymouth, are producing attractive, bright, practical, tail-finned station wagons like the Suburban. The demand was recognised by German coach builder Lug, who produced a combi body for the 170V, marketed as Merzweckwagen Type 802C, or multi-purpose trolley. The tagline was the versatile vehicle for work and relaxation. That became the enduring ethos for station wagons. Practical but fun. Move some furniture, then take them to the beach. Lug had created the first Mercedes estate. It featured rear seats that folded flat to give a large cargo area, which they said would take 460 kilos of luggage. Lug also offered an ambulance or Krankenwagen, a Pullman limousine, a panel van, a pickup truck and a hearse. Mercedes actually offered their own factory panel van and ambulance conversions, but these were slightly different to the Lug offerings. Lug offered their 170V estate from 1953 until 1955, when production of the 136 series was wound down in favour of the new Ponton models. Another German coach builder, Benz, also produced combi versions of the 170V. Unlike the Lug offerings, Benz estates did not have full-sized rear doors. The estate car as a concept is almost always associated with the full-size executive car segment of the market, and not traditionally with luxury end of the range. However, the advantage of coach building is that the only limit is your own bank account. In 1956, a presumably very wealthy woman by the name of Caroline Folks walked into a New York City car dealership, a Mercedes dealership, and asked for an estate, or a station wagon probably, a 300 at an hour station wagon. The W186, or 300, was the most prestigious vehicle Mercedes sold in the 1950s. The company had what we would call an S-Class today, in the form of the W187 and later the early W186 cylinder pontons. These sold for about 12,500 Deutschmarks. The 300, on the other hand, cost nearly twice as much, at 23,500 Deutschmarks. The 300 was sold from 1951 to 1962, when it was replaced at the top of the range by the 600 Grosser. It's often called Adenauer, after Konrad Adenauer, the first Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, who presided over the country during the economic miracle, as it was called. The car was hand-built and technologically advanced, sharing design and mechanics with the 300 SL Gullwing. In the mid-1950s, Daimler-Benz was keen to break into the North American market and did not hesitate to grant Mrs. Folk's wish. A 300C saloon was ordered, 
C was simply the current iteration of the 300 at the time. During its production life, it would go through four, the 300, then B, C and D. Mrs. Folks's 300 C was sent straight from the factory at Stuttgart, not to Lug, but to the Binns Coach Builders Works at the nearby town of Lorch. When they received the 300, Binns likely removed the entire roof and body from the front door's back before fabricating a new one-piece roof, rear section and tailgate. The rear doors had to be substantially modified to fit the new body. This is the only known 300 station wagon and currently survives in a private collection. In all, 16 300 saloon chassis were sold to coach building firms. Most of these were 300 Bs to Misen for ambulance conversion or to Lug or Krasboho to be made into hearses. Mrs. Folk's 300 C went to Bins for its combi conversion and a single 300 D went to Bins to become an ambulance. While we're on the subject of the 300, Stuttgart's engineers did a conversion of their own. The 300 measuring car was built for the testing department to remotely monitor new cars under development, as the equipment required in the early 1960s was too bulky to carry in the car being developed. The measuring car drove behind on the test track, linked by a set of cables, while an engineer sat with the monitoring equipment in the 300. The sole example survives in the Mercedes-Benz Museum. In 1953, Daimler-Benz introduced the first of its four-cylinder Ponton models, the first unibody cars from the company. The 180 1.8 litre petrol was followed in 1954 by 1.8 diesel, the 180 D. In its first year, the 180 D accounted for 44% of all Mercedes-Benz car production. In 1956, the 190 was also introduced, featuring a detuned version of the overhead cam 1.9 litre engine from the 190 SL sports car. A 190 D followed shortly afterwards. The fact that the pontons were of unibody or monocoque construction would have made offering a chassis for coach builders tricky. There was no chassis to offer. Mercedes compromised by creating a chassis frame for special vehicles to sell to the coach builders. As with the 170V before, the demand for hearses and ambulance conversions alone would make this worthwhile. Both Bins and Misen offered combi conversions of the four-cylinder Ponton models. These were approved by Mercedes-Benz and sold through the existing dealer network. From 1955, Bins offered a tiny roofline extension with folding seats and the option of a single rear door or a split tailgate. The Misen version could be distinguished by its higher roofline and less modified rear doors, while the Bins version had its rear doors squared off. The Bins version seems to have been the more common of the two, with more examples currently for sale than the Misen version. An Austrian coach builder called Jaunig also produced a combi version of the 180, although there is not much information on these available. As well as the four-cylinder pontons, there is evidence that Bins produced at least three 219 combis. The 219 was a halfway house model between the upper and the lower spec models. They had the longer engine bay of the 220, but without the longer wheelbase of those cars. Instead, the shorter bodywork of the W180 was present from the A-pillar back. They also had a comparatively spartan interior and were marketed as sort of a driver's car for customers who wanted the more powerful engine but didn't need the luxury appointments of the higher spec cars. At least one of these is known to have survived. In 1961, Mercedes brought out the first four-cylinder Fintail models. These were to replace the four-cylinder Pontons. In 1959, the six-cylinder Ponton saloon models gave way to the first of the six-cylinder Fintail cars with the 220, 220S and 220SE in the W111 series. It was a further two years before the four-cylinder fintails arrived to replace the Ponton counterparts. And with these came the now familiar chassis for special vehicles, which the coach builders could base their work on. The W110 lower range of fintail models shared their bodywork with the six-cylinder cars from the A-pillar back but with shorter bonnets and round headlights instead of the longer light units on the upper range cars. Confusingly, one of the 110s, the 230, was fitted with the M180 inline six cylinder engine of the higher spec cars, but it retained the shorter bonnet and round headlights of the four cylinder cars. Bins and Misen waited patiently for the four cylinder cars and immediately switched from the outgoing pontons to fintail conversions. This time around, the Bins version could be distinguished by a higher roof line and a larger tailgate which necessitated the redesigning of the taillights. Some Bins cars 
had small brown taillights and some had a triangular cluster. The Mizen cars retained the saloon's rear light shape with a smaller tailgate above. Larger, 15-inch wheels were fitted to cope with any extra weight. 13-inch wheels were standard on the Fintail saloons at this time. As with the Pontons, Bins and Mizen only converted the four-cylinder lower range models. Belgian coach builder Jacques Kuhn, however, produced their own station wagon based on the six-cylinder cars. This striking conversion used the C-pillar of the saloon as the estate's D-pillar. A number of 220, 220S and 220SE fintails were converted and sold this way in the early 1960s. In the mid-1960s, Stuttgart turned its back on Bins and Miesen and approached IMA of Belgium to produce ambulances and other special bodied vehicles. IMA's station wagon was known as the Universal. It was available briefly in 1965 on the last of the first series W110s, the 190 and the 190D, and from autumn that year it was subsequently available in 200, 200D, 230 and 230S form on the second series fintails. IMA sold around 2,000 Fintail Universals, and in summer 1966, their factory was also actually turning out around 25 Fintail saloons per day for Mercedes-Benz. IMA was the Belgian importer of Mercedes, and European Economic Community tariffs at the time meant it made financial sense to ship complete knockdown kits for the saloon cars to IMA for assembly. These could then be sold 40% cheaper than if they had been built in Germany. The IMA Universals featured 15-inch wheels, as the Bins and Miesen offerings had, as well as heavy-duty suspension with a Bodge Hydromat self-levelling strut. When Mercedes started building their own estates, all to this day would feature self-levelling rear suspension. Universals could be fitted with a third row of rear-facing seats, as well as split-folding second row of seats for greater versatility of load carrying. Two features Mercedes would also carry through with their own estates, the Universal was around a third more expensive than the standard saloon fintail, weighed 105 kilograms more and was 3.5 centimetres higher. In 1968, Mercedes introduced its new generation models. These are sometimes called Stroke 8 or Strict Act. These replaced the fintails in the lower end of the model range. The W114 series refers to six cylinder equipped cars, initially in 230, 2.3 litre, and 250, 2.5 litre form. In the second series, or post facelift, a 2.8 litre was added. Initially this was still badged 250, but then later 280 using the twin cam M110 engine. W115 referred to the four cylinder models of the range. 200, 200D for diesel, 220 and 220D initially. In their second series, a four cylinder 230 was also produced. Badge 230.4 to distinguish from the 6 cylinder 230s still in production. These got 230.6 badging. A 240D was also added to the range using the OM616 engine and also a 240D with a 3.0 badging using the 5 cylinder OM617. Mercedes themselves seriously considered producing an estate version to the point of building a working prototype. This received its form approval from management, but it was deemed that to make production worthwhile, the Combi would have to sell 10% more than the long wheelbase cars and be less than 10% more expensive than them. The factory did not think that this was feasible and the project was dropped. The working prototype was used around the factory but eventually disappeared. Stuttgart did, however, continue providing chassis for special bodies which now looked like a stripped out saloon car. These were delivered without a roof skin, parcel shelf or boot partition, and the rear had extra reinforcement between the shock absorbers to compensate for the lack of roof. The factory also produced special combination tail lights, which solved that problem for the coach builders. This option was an expensive one though. In 1971, a 220 saloon cost 13,819 Deutschmarks. The chassis alone cost nearly that at 13,485 Deutschmarks. Bins, for example, charged another 8,069 Deutschmarks for a finished combi. Along with Miesen, both companies continued to build combis alongside their ambulance and hearse versions, but production numbers were very low at this time. 
Bins built a maximum of 250, and Misen just 60 station wagons throughout the entire production run of the W114 and 115. Both offerings featured a new full-length roofline, and neither altered the rear passenger doors at the C-pillar. The Bins version can be distinguished by exposed tailgate hinges on the roof, while the Misen version conceals these. Coach builder Movauto in Portugal also produced a station wagon which was popular on the Portuguese market. An Argentine coach builder also produced their own example based on the factory prototype and known as the Ruro. Jarnig produced a 115 combi which used the triangular rear light clusters that the IMA used on their Fintail Universals. IMA still had their affiliation with the factory and by 1969 they were advertising combis based on the 220 diesel and petrol and the six cylinder 230s. These were still available through Mercedes dealer networks and found success in Belgium, Germany and the UK until 1973. They can be distinguished by their raised roof line with vinyl covering. Worth a special note at this point is the Crayford Engineering Company of Kent in the United Kingdom. Crayford produced estate and cabriolet versions of a few different cars such as the Triumph 2000, Vauxhall Victor and Ford Cortina. Their attentions turned to Mercedes and they selected the 4-cylinder 220 and the 6-cylinder 250 and later 280 to convert to estate form. The Crayford Estates used rear lights at the saloon version, with a hatchback door along the same boot line as the saloon. The roof was vinyl wrapped to hide the weld joints of the new section and sloped towards the rear, unlike most other combi conversions. Crayford also produced an interesting estate called the Dachshund. This was based on the long wheelbase chassis Stroke 8. I'll let you decide what you think of the finished styling. Crayford didn't stop at the Stroke 8s though. They produced a limited run estate version of the larger W108 and W109 S class car, including 12 6.3 versions. These were similar to the smaller W114 and 115s, with a retained saloon boot line, vinyl sloping roof, and slightly awkward looking rear side windows. Into the 1970s, Crayford converted other Mercedes cars. Most seen are their W123 Cabriolets, which they marketed as Saint-Tropez. There was also a shooting brake based on the W107 SLC called Condor, and a Landau version of the W116 S-Class. The company hadn't planned on an estate version of the W116, due to the fuel tank now being positioned behind the rear seats. Owing to demand, Crayford did in fact produce one using parts from the contemporary Ford Granada estates. The W116 succeeded the W108 and 109 series in the S-Class segment of the Mercedes lineup in 1972. Aside from Crayford, German coach builder Pullman, who had built Hearst versions of Mercedes at least as far back as the 1940s, made a foray into combi conversion with a few W116 examples, including one 6.9 litre engine car. By the time the W123 series was under development, Stuttgart had decided it would include its own estate in the range. The factory combi would be badge T for touring and transport. The 123 series was in such high demand that there was a full year's wait for new cars throughout its entire nine year production run. Second hand examples changed hands for more than the price of a new car, with customers wanting to avoid the waiting list. There simply wasn't enough space in the Sintelfingen factory to build the estates, so the old Borgward factory at Bremen was chosen for their production lines. By the time the car went out of production in 1985, the T model had sold 200,000 examples, far exceeding original sales targets. Mercedes has built executive class estate cars with every consecutive model since. The coach built Mercedes story doesn't end there. Into the 1980s and 90s a multitude of companies converted Mercedes for an ever more imaginative and demanding clientele. But that's a story for a future video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed why not subscribe to us, we hope to produce more historical videos going forward and feel free to suggest any topic you'd like to see.